Yeah, it's 29 and a half minutes from now, but remember, they left this side a little bit late. There he is. Okay. So Jim, you better make it clear to Parker that we got the pull out. Even as the astronauts were urged on to their next stop, scientists were interpreting the first signals of the experiments which had already been put into action. Well, many parts of the LSAP are functioning very well. The uh, heat flow experiment is working excellently. It's transmitting back temperature data. The uh, cooling down is still cooling down from the, uh, the drilling process, and in a few hours, they should be starting to get true heat flow information. Let's see if I can't crash the uh, corner and get that contact. See if I can't get it. <laughs> Look at the folders out there. Jesus. <laughs> Despite being on the moon, Cernan and Schmidt were quite clearly not overawed by being the focus of so much scientific attention. I was strolling on the moon one day in, in a merry, merry, merry month of December. Now, May. May. May's the month. May, that's right. May is the year of the month. Oh, what a nice day. Oh, I'm going to be not a cloud in the sky, except in the Earth. The second day of exploration began with repairs to the rear fender of the rover, which had broken the previous day. In Houston, Apollo 16 Commander John Young had worked that night in a pressure suit trying to find a way to repair the damage. Following his instructions, the astronauts made a new fender, formed from a lunar map molded with tape and held in place with clamps from the lunar module telescope. The repair was successful and the astronauts were no longer bothered by dust as they drove to a series of sampling stations after setting up further experiments in the neighborhood of the lunar module itself. They're somewhere along this rim where they can see. But they're, but they're dropping, Bill, so they must be coming across them. We're right where we wanted to be for station two, and it looks like a great place. Big blocks, it looks like quite a bit of variety from here, different colors anyway. Pretty hard, isn't it? That boulder's gonna roll. Man, that is hard. <laughs> Just don't stub your toe. The foreground features are somewhat different. That's simply because they were farther up onto the hill, I think. But that's, otherwise, that's remarkable. Pottery, it's obviously very, uh, very cohesive because it's, it's, uh, the bottom of the core is not smooth. It's very jaggedy and fragmental-like. Gene's finished with the uh, uh, core tube. Then we should be able to go. If we get that get all of that. Jack Schmidt having a few problems. Of all the stations sampled during the second day, none caused more excitement than the find close to a crater called Shorty. Tony, to do it, no matter which way you want to do it. We need more time. 
We may have to pull it. We have to put five in a little bit. He's getting about uh, about three centimeters of wax. They got to leave at a certain time, regardless of what we got. With only a limited supply of oxygen and water in the backpack sea, astronauts were bound to a tight schedule. Every minute of their exploration had been carefully planned ahead of time using detailed photographs made by orbiting cameras. Surprise discoveries like the orange soil left the scientists at Houston with tantalizing decisions. In the end, shortage of time always sent Cernan and Schmidt hopping back to their rover and on to the next site, or back to the lunar laboratory to activate experiments. We'd like you to leave immediately. Okay. My golly, this time goes fast. While Cernan and Schmidt had been exploring, Ron Evans in the command module had been taking photographs and operating experiments directed at the moon's surface. After three days of observation, he was rejoined by his crewmates. 99, proceeded. Three, two, one. Houston. Right away, Houston. That's your good. Ag spot. Get over. Their exploration and scientific work behind them, the astronauts once again became pilots as they guided their lunar landing craft into dock with Ron Evans' command module for the flight back to Earth. They left behind an automatic laboratory which would function for years and several explosive packages to be detonated later in order to map discontinuities in the lunar interior. With them, they brought back 250 pounds of samples as well as a mass of recorded data. Their spot-on splashdown was a fitting climax to the Apollo program. Unfortunately, the orange soil was not what the scientists back at Houston had expected that it might be. They thought it was perhaps produced by the action of watery volcanic gases on the surface material, and that would have been the first indication of water on the surface of the moon. But in fact, the orange soil was a collection of tiny glass spheres that were orange because of their high content of titanium and iron, and those glass spheres were thrown out either by a meteorite impact or by a, a volcanic explosion. In fact, it turned out about 3.7 billion years ago. And that fact uh, reminds us of something that maybe we forget when we look at the surface of the moon, and that is that there isn't any erosion there. The glass spheres had lain there practically on the surface for nearly 4 billion years without being disturbed. And that's something that we have to remember is very, very different from on the moon than on the Earth, where rain and wind and so forth is constantly wearing down the surface features. But the rocks are what are important on the moon and what can give us a plausible story in the development of the moon. Those rocks are basically of three types. There's the anorthosite, the white rock composed of the plagioclase feldspar we call anorthite, which you heard Dr. Urey mention, and which was Apollo 15's big find. Then there's the so-called lunar norite, which is a little bit like a gabbro, but misleadingly light in color. And then there's basalt that we've met before on the Earth, and which on the Moon is very similar. And then, finally, another kind of rock that's commonly found on the Moon, breccia meteorite or volcanic breccia. Uh, this is, in fact, a sample from Sudbury. And it's one of the main rocks that the astronauts came here to look at, very similar to the, uh, to the rock on the moon. But the breccia is just an agglomeration of fragments of earlier rocks. And it's these three, the anorthosite, the gabbro, and the basalt, which are the fundamental components of the uh, the moon, so far as we've been able to examine them, and it's those three rocks which give us information about the development of the moon.